Welcome to this Unreal Engine 5 tutorial series on how to create smart enemy AI. Now, smart enemies are ones that react to their environment, like this enemy here that searches for a wall to hide behind. And then after a few seconds, it comes out, attacks the player, and hide again. Now, smart enemies can also react to the player's actions, like this enemy that teleports if the player gets too close to it. And also, it even reacts to the player shooting an arrow at it and dodges away from the arrow, as you see here. Now, if I damage this enemy and bring its health low enough, it can even recognize its health is low and react to its own internal state by healing. Now, to do all of this, we're going to be using a lot of AI tools that come with Unreal Engine, uh, such as behavior trees that you see here to control the enemy's actions. Also, the EQS, or the Environment Query System, uh, which allows enemies to collect data from their environment uh, to position themselves in a smart way and make smart decisions about where they should be in the world and what's around them. We're also going to be set up a perception system that allows enemy to perceive sounds and sights, uh, like this enemy that's perceiving um, the sound of my arrow hitting the floor, and it goes to investigate. Now. In part one, we're going to set up a basic behavior tree and an AI controller that will allow the enemy to chase the player around, like you see here. And once the enemy reaches the player, it will try to attack, wait for a few seconds, and then repeat. So let's get started. So I'm uh, starting off with the third person templates here, and I have, um, I'm also using Unreal Engine 5.2, which just came out at the uh, time of recording this video. And I have two small additions to this uh, template, uh, which is uh, this beautiful sword mesh that I just created really quickly to um, yeah, uh, have a sword to swing around. And uh, this um, sword slash animation uh, which I got from Mixamo and retargeted to the Unreal Engine mannequin. Uh, I'm going to leave all the assets, including the Mixamo to Unreal retargeter, um, uh, that would allow you to retarget any asset from Mixamo to the Unreal Engine mannequin, um, in my Patreon. I'll leave the link uh, down in the description if you want to download those. Um, all right, so first thing we're going to do is let's create a player and an enemy. So I'm going to right click here in our content folder and create a player folder and create one for all of our enemies. So we're going to have multiple enemies. Um, and now in third person blueprints, I'm going to duplicate so control D and duplicate the third person character and create call it player and move it to our player folder. And also open up this third person game mode and change the default pawn class to be your BP player instead of third person character. Um, and now also let's go to the player, duplicate that and call it BP enemy base and move it to our enemies folder. And the reason I'm calling it base is because this is going to be the base class that all the different enemy types inherit from. Um, all right, let's open up this uh, base enemy and delete everything here. We don't need any of that. Uh, we don't need a follow camera. We don't need a camera boom. And also let's change the mesh to be um, Manny underscore simple instead of Quinn. And also the animation blueprint to ABP underscore Manny. Great. Um, now back here in our level, let's pop in our enemy in the world. And now we have a player and we have an enemy. Oh, and let's uh, remove this clipping that happens when the camera gets in front of the enemy. So back here in our enemy base, on our mesh, scroll down to collision and switch it to custom and ignore camera. And do the same for the capsule as well. Collision, custom, and ignore camera. Compile and save. Now there should be no more clipping. All right. Now what we're going to do now is add very basic uh, behavior for our enemy, um, moving and attacking, things like that. And we're going to do it all in blueprints and then uh, move it to behavior trees uh, to show you how you can achieve the same simple result in the behavior trees and of course add more complex logic and behavior to it. 
So let's first open up our event graph for the enemy and add a custom event. Whoop. Call this chase player. And what this will do is it will call AI move to this one. And AI move to just uh, takes a pawn, which will be a reference to our self, which is the enemy and either a destination or a target actor. So we want it to move to our player character. So pull off of here and search for get player character. Right now we only have one player and one target. So it's always going to be the player. And the acceptance radius is how far it should stop before the reaching this target. So let's say 150 units or 1.5 meters. Um, then on success, let's add a delay. Let's wait for two seconds and then start chasing the player again. Great. Now search for event begin play and call this chase player on begin play. Um, now you'll notice that actually nothing happens. And the reason is the AI move to function um, requires there to be a nav mesh in the world to, to tell the AI how to move and how to navigate. So we go into our level here uh, let's see the whole level. In your quick add menu, search for nav and take the nav mesh bounds volume, put it somewhere here, and then just scale it until it extends the full bounds of your level. Um, oh, that's a bit too big. Yeah, something like that. And then if you press P, You'll see all the areas that the player can move. Make sure that everything is green. Great. Now, all the green areas are the areas where the enemy, sorry, can uh, can navigate to. Let's P again. Now, if we play, the chase works. The enemy chases us, and after two seconds, starts chasing again. Great. Now, let's um, let's give the enemy a simple attack function. So back here in our enemy again, add a custom event and call this attack. And what attack will do is we'll just play an, a montage. So search for play montage and make sure to select this one, not the anim montage, because this one has a lot of um, execution pins like on complete, on interrupt that we'll be using as well. Now it takes a skeletal mesh, which will be our enemy mesh. And we don't have any montage yet to play, so let's go ahead and create that. Um, so in our animations folder, I showed you we have this animation. I'm going to right click and say create anim montage and call it montage underscore sword underscore slash. Right now you can pop this montage here or of course select it from the drop down. Um, for now, this is all the attack is going to do. We just play this montage. So now bef as soon as we reach the enemy, uh, sorry, reach the, the enemy reaches the player, let's call attack. And let's see how this looks like. Now you see the animation looks quite strange. Uh, you see the feet and how the and the character is leaning forward. Now this is not an issue with the animation itself because you can see here that it looks fine. And it's actually an issue with uh, the um, foot IK that comes on the mannequin. Uh, what that is, if you look here, if I'm standing on an uneven surface like this, the feet are always trying to find the ground. Uh, as opposed to floating in the air like this. Um, now, this is a feature that's in the animation blueprint of Manny, uh, but it also doesn't play well with animations that move the feet. So I'm going to detour really quick from the AI tutorial and show you how to fix this in a couple of minutes. So if you go to your content folder under Characters, Mannequin, Animation, you'll see this ABP Manny. Um, and it has here a control rig uh, that does the IK and an alpha value. Now, if I switch this alpha value to zero, you'll see that the animation now plays properly, but we lost the foot IK functionality. So we want to keep both. We only want to disable this when uh, an animation, uh, a specific animation is playing. Um, so let me show you how to do that. In your montage animation here, uh, the sword montage, we're going to add a curve that comes with the third person template called disable leg IK. 
And I'm gonna set the value of this curve, so double click the curve, right click, add a key, and set the value to one at time zero, so that the value of the key is just always uh, at one. And then back here in our animation blueprint for the Manny, I'm going to pull off of the alpha, select float, and if the curve's value is greater than zero, I want their, the alpha to be zero, otherwise I want the alpha to be one. So to do that, I'm gonna get curve, whoa, get curve value, and the name of the curve is disable leg ik. And if this value is greater than zero, then set the alpha to zero, otherwise set the alpha to one. Great, let's see how this looks like now. Animation is working properly. And foot IK is also working properly. Nice. So this will be very useful for any animation that moves the feet of the, um, uh, the mannequin. So now back to our um, AI tutorial. Now we have a very basic uh, AI functionality. The enemy chases the player. Once it reaches the player, it does this attack montage and then just repeats. So I'm gonna show you how to move all of this over to behavior trees and then add more complex logic to it. And we're gonna start building now all of the behavior of the enemy inside the behavior tree instead of inside blueprints. Now let's open up our content drawer again. And uh, let's, inside this enemies folder, let's create a new folder and call it AI. This is going to have all of the AI functionality that we'll be creating uh, throughout this tutorial series. Now, the first thing we want to create here is a behavior tree and a blackboard. Now, both of these always come together. So let me show you what that looks like. So right click and search for behavior tree, uh, or you can also find it uh, under artificial intelligence behavior tree. I'm going to call this one BT enemy base. Also enemy base because we can have a different behavior tree for every different enemy type, like one for a ranged enemy, one for a melee enemy, one for a defensive, and so on. And also under artificial intelligence, create a blackboard and call this BP enemy base as well. Now, if you open up this uh, behavior tree, you would you want to give it a blackboard or tell it which blackboard's associated with. But since we only have one blackboard, uh, it already found it uh, on its own. Now, I'm going to quickly describe what a behavior tree is and uh, how blackboards are used. Uh, but I'm not going to dive into too much detail until we actually start implementing the behaviors, so that you'll uh, see more in practice how it looks like. Now, a behavior tree is just a sequence of actions or tasks that uh, an enemy AI can uh, perform. And it's always um, depends on two things. If you pull out here, you can either create a selector or you can create a sequence. Now, a selector selects between different tasks that can be done. So you either attack or you heal. You either uh, run away or you teleport. Whatever uh, different task you're trying to pick from, the selector is the node you want to use. And sequence is a node that does a lot of tasks in sequence. Now, of course, they can be, since it's a tree, they can be uh, nested uh, like this, and you have um, sequences followed by selectors and so on. And at the end, you really have to run a task. So these are all the tasks that come with the behavior tree or with Unreal Engine. Uh, but you also have, you can also create custom tasks for yourself. So um, one thing to note about selectors is that they will always run the tasks from left to the right. And the selector only succeeds and moves on to the next node if all of the tasks under it succeed as well. So if I have a move to, then a wait, then uh, I don't know, a play animation or something, this one has to succeed and this one has to succeed and this one has to succeed. And they can fail if, for example, the AI couldn't reach the uh, move to the target, then it's failed. Then it won't do these. It will go back up and see, um, and try to run it again. Um, sorry, this is all under sequence, by the way, not selector. Now, selector is different that it tries to to find the first one that succeeds. So if I have a, uh, a selector here and move two succeeds, then it's not going to go to the wait because move two already succeeded. But if it fails, then it's gonna try to do the wait. And if that one fails, then it's gonna try to do the play animation and so on. Um, now, this will make a lot more sense once we start actually doing it. So 
let's add some uh, very basic behavior. Um, the same behavior that we have here, in fact, in our blueprint. Um, all right, so first thing we want the enemy to chase the uh, player. So let's add a sequence node here because we're gonna do a sequence of actions now. And the first one is um, luckily a task we already have, which is move to. Now, the way you, um, you can think of tasks as like functions in uh, the behavior trees and the input to the function is a blackboard key. Now, what is a blackboard exactly? Now, if you go here to the blackboard tab or open your blackboard from the content drawer, uh, you'll see that the blackboard is just a collection of variables or keys um, that can be used inside the behavior tree. So you can always add new keys here of different types and then you can start assigning values to them. So for example, um, in our behavior tree, we want to move to the player character. So we need a key that points to the player character or whatever we're moving. So I'm gonna go to my blackboard and create a new key uh, of type object. Well, we want it to be of type actor, but here you can only select high level types. Um, I'm gonna call this uh, attack target. I can also call it player, but attack target is more general in case we want the enemy to attack other targets than the player. And on the right here under key type, choose actor here as your base class. So inside this actor target, uh, sorry, inside this attack target in our behavior tree, we can now select it as the move to target. So now I'm telling it move to the attack target and everything else here um, is similar to what we set up already. So acceptable radius is 150 and um, yeah, we can leave everything else the same. You can also rename this node, maybe call it move to um, target. Now we have this attack target set up in the blackboard, but how do we actually run the behavior tree and assign values to the blackboard variables? Um, all this is handled inside the AI controller. Now, if you go to your base enemy uh, and look at class defaults, search here for AI controller, and you'll see that any pawn class already comes with the default AI controller associated with it. Now, the AI controller is sort of like the brain of the, um, of the pawn, but we want to create our own AI controller to run the behavior tree and uh, do other um, uh, AI related things. So over here in our AI folder, right click, create a blueprint class, and the type is search for AI controller. Um, now you have also detour crowd AI controller and grid path AI controller. Uh, this is for like, if you have uh, hundreds of enemies or like simulation of crowd and you want them to um, uh, do collision detection and things like that, then you'd use this one. And grid path AI controller is if you have enemy AI or just AI in general that are moving in a grid pattern. Uh, for us, we're just gonna use the base AI controller class and call this uh, AIC underscore enemy underscore base. Again, you can have a different AI controller per enemy type. Um, now, if you open up this AI controller and go to the event graph, um, looks similar to a normal blueprint because it is a blueprint at the end, but we don't need this event begin play and event tick. We need a new event called event on possess. Now this is the event that's called when the AI controller possesses or takes control of a pawn, which can happen multiple times. Uh, so you better use this rather than event begin play to set up your uh, behaviors. Now, you can say something like run behavior tree. It's a function inside the AI controller and it takes a behavior tree that we just created here. And that's it, that's really how you run a behavior tree. But how do you assign values to the blackboard? Well, if you look on your variables here on the left, and by the way, if you don't see this, click on the gear icon and say show inherited variables. Uh, you'll see a variable called blackboard and because this behavior tree knows which blackboard is associated with it, then this, val this variable will already have a uh, the value of our blackboard. So you can get the blackboard here, pull off it and say set value as. Now we're setting the value of a blackboard key and blackboard keys can be of any type here. So you need to specify what type you're trying to set. So we want to set our attack target key, which has a type of object. So use set value as object. 
and the key name here has to be exactly the key name that we set in the blackboard. Now you can just pull off and say make literal Whoa. and write the value here, but I always prefer to make these variables. So right click, promote the variable, and call this one attack target key name. Now compile and save to give this a default value. I'm going to actually go over to my blackboard and copy it to make sure I have no typos and paste it back here. Now this is the key name, but what's the actual value? The value is the get player character. So we just set the blackboard key with this name to this value. Um, now one thing you should know is that on possess actually runs before on begin play. So get player character will probably not have a value at this point. So I'm going to add a really short delay, it can be even a delay of zero. Uh, we just want uh, the player character's execution or begin play to finish first. Um, great, now we set up our AI controller, we set up our behavior tree. Now we need to go back to our enemy class, our base enemy, search for AI controller here, and choose the one that we just created. So we're switching the AI controller that it's using. Um, now if I go over here in our uh, chase player function, I can delete it. So we're not doing anything on play. Uh, but let's see what, uh, how the enemy behaves now. So you see the enemy is still chasing us, even though I'm not calling our uh, uh, chase player on begin play. I can actually delete this chase player altogether. I'm going to keep the attack. Um, and now you'll see that it's still working. Now let me show you how you can see the behavior tree in action. So I'm going to take this behavior tree and just put it somewhere here uh, on the right. Let's make sure everything is in view. And I'm going to play. And you can see here the how it's um, this in the sequence of actions that it's doing. So it keeps trying to move the target over and over and over again, and it's already at the target, so it's not doing anything. But this is how you can debug your tree and see what's uh, going on. So let's add more functionality to it. Um, we had it wait, right? So when it moves to the target, it waits two seconds. So now I'm going to add a wait, and the wait time is two seconds. Let me also keep this uh, on the right here so you can see what's happening. Now the enemy reaches us, waits two seconds, and then re restarts the sequence. Excellent. Um, we also had the enemy attacking us, but of course we don't have a, a task for attack. So this is when we start creating our custom tasks. Um, all right, so to do that, um, first, let me create a new folder inside our AI folder and call this one tasks. And then in your behavior tree on the top here, uh, say new task, select where you want it to be. And we're going to name it BTT, which stands for behavior tree task. And we'll call this um, default attack. Well, default attack. Great. Um, now, a behavior tree task um, looks like a blueprint as well and has two very important execution nodes that you have to remember. So we're going to right click here and say, um, oh, sorry, AI receive. So this event receive uh, execute AI, this one. Uh, this is sort of your begin play or what happens when the task is uh, starts executing. And it will always give you the pawn that's executing this task or the pawn that the behavior tree is running on and the AI controller as well. And a second node is finish, whoa, finish execute. Now you have to call this finish execute when you're done and whether it succeeded or not, otherwise you'll be stuck in this task forever. So don't forget to call this when you're done. And everything in between is what the actual task does. Now, this is the attack task, and we know which pawn we're running on, um, but we can cast to our enemy base because we know we're running on this enemy. And we know the enemy also has an attack function, so we can just call attack. 
and then we can finish execute. Um, this is not the exactly the right way to do this, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, but let's see what this does. So uh, again, take our tree, put it here on the right. And now let's add our custom task that's called uh, attack. Um, and remember that this execution is from left to right. So we actually want the attack to be before the wait. So reach the enemy, attack, and then wait two seconds. I reach the player. Now let's see what this looks like. So it's reaching us, it's attacking, and it's waiting two seconds. Great. Now what if I didn't have this wait? What will happen? Now if I didn't have this wait, this will happen. You see the enemy is stuck in the attack state, but it's not actually attacking, because it's trying to attack, then it's finishing the attack and moving back to move target. It's trying to move the target, but then it's doing the attack. So it's jumping between these two nodes really quickly uh, because it doesn't actually wait for the attack to finish before going back to the previous uh, task. Um, and we want to fix that. Um, so right now, if you open up your uh, default attack task, you'll see that uh, we call finish execute right after we call attack but we don't actually wait for attack to finish. That means that uh, we're going to finish executing as soon as we enter uh, this task. And then when we finish executing, then we go back up the tree and try to execute whatever uh, we had else here, which is move to target. That's why it keeps bouncing between the two states. Um, so let's actually wait until attack is finished before calling finish execute. Now, how do we do that? Now, um, if you go here, um, oh, actually, I need to remove this. Yeah, so if you go here on the left, we're going to add an event dispatcher, uh, which is what I actually just deleted now because I had it before. Uh, but let me show you how we're going to add this. Uh, we're going to add an event, call it on attack end, and then call this uh, when on completed of the montage or on interrupted. So whether the montage completes or interrupts, in both cases, we want to end this uh, attack. Um, now you can pretend that interrupt is a fail and completes a success, but we're not gonna do that right now. We're just gonna treat both, both as a success. So back here in our default uh, attack task, pull off of the base enemy and say assign on attack end and call this finished attacking. And now we are going to plug in the finish execute on this event instead of immediately after attack. So let's see what this looks like now. Mm -hmm. Move the behavior tree here. Now if I debug this, now it reaches me, stays in the default attack. So you'll see it stays highlighted, then moves back to, ma to move target only when default attack finishes. So now it's still in move target because it hasn't reached me, reaches me, default attack, back to move target, and so on. Uh, but it keeps attacking over and over again if it's already reached me. And that's why I'm going to add back the wait node. So let's say wait for just one second between attacks. All right, now this is a very basic uh, sequence. Uh, I named the sequence here Chase Player. You can rename the sequence uh, however you like here as well. Um, but we want to add more to it. And first thing we want to add is fixing a bug that you'll, I'll show you here. Now if I'm behind the enemy, attack um, uh, the attack radius or the enemy is still within the radius. So it keeps attacking even though it's not looking at me. So we wanna make sure that the enemy always looks at the player when it attacks. Um, so to do that, we're going to go back here to our behavior tree and add a new task. Um, use blueprint base as the base and call this BTT focus target. Again, call uh, receive execute AI and finish execute. Always start with these two. Um, and off of the, uh, the owner controller, there is a function called uh, set focus. 
And this takes a, uh, an actor to focus on. And this actor, we want it to be whatever our attack target is. Now, how do we actually pass input into our tasks? Now, input in the tasks will only be passing or mainly be passing in the form of uh, Blackboard keys. So go over here in the variables and create a new variable, call it attack target key. And this is going to be of type search for Blackboard, Blackboard key selector, and click on the eye icon to be instance editable. Now this Blackboard key selector is actually a type uh, specific for the Blackboard, uh, but it's only the name of the key, uh, but not the actual value of it. So we're gonna pull off of it and say, get value as, and we know that the value of the attack target is an actor. So say get value as actor, and then plug this actor here. Uh, compile and save. And now back in our uh, behavior tree, right before we attack, we're going to call this focus target. And you'll see here on the details panel, we have this attack target key, which gives us a drop down to select from one of our uh, blackboard keys. Now we're going to select attack target here. Um, also, just for good practice, I'm going to add this to a category called keys. Um, that way in our behavior tree here, you can see that it's under a keys tab. Now let's see if this works. And now behind the enemy, yes, the enemy is um, focusing us. Now one very important thing, um, you probably don't have this by default, uh, I must have changed it at some point. But if you go on your character movement uh, in your base enemy pawn and search for rotation, uh, make sure you have use controller desired rotation and not orient rotation to movement. Because if you have orient rotation to movement, then set focus won't do anything. So make sure on your character movement component in your base enemy class to use con uh, controller desired rotation. Great. Now we need to fix another issue. Um, now after attacking us, the enemy stays focused on us, which means that they're going to strafe like this. Yeah, that's not normal behavior. Uh, we want the enemy when they're moving and not attacking to not be focused on us, uh, to be looking at where they're going. So let's pop back to our behavior tree, create a new task uh, off of blueprint base again, uh, put it in our tasks folder and call this BTT clear focus. Again, search for event receive execute AI and finish execute with success true. Um, and then off of owner controller, just call clear focus and doesn't take any input, very simple task. Now, basically, this is what you'll be doing when dealing with behavior trees, you're going to be creating very simple and uh, focused tasks that do one action, and you're going to have a lot of them. And that's really how behavior trees work. Um, Alright, so back in our behavior tree here, um, after we finish attacking, um, or actually maybe right before we move to the target, always clear focus first, then move to the target. Then once you reach the target, focus that target and attack that target. Then wait one second and repeat the whole thing over again. So let's test it again. Enemy is focused on us. Now if we go somewhere, they are not strafing anymore. Great. They look where they're going. Perfect. Um, now one last thing I want to do before we end this part one is actually give the enemy a sword because right now the enemy is just hitting us with their fist. So let's put a sword in their hand. So go over here to our base uh, enemy class and under mesh, uh, double click your skeletal mesh asset. And I want the sword to be added here to the uh, right hand. So I'm going to search in the skeleton tree for hand underscore R right click that and say add socket. Uh, now a socket is just a scene uh, on attached to this mesh that we can uh, uh, attach uh, different uh, actors and, uh, and meshes to. So I'm going to call this socket hand underscore r underscore sword underscore socket. Now if you want to see what a specific mesh will look like attached to this socket, you can say add preview asset here 
and select the mesh you want. In our case, it's sword. Now you can um, transform this. So move it around until it's in the position that you want. Oh, and also on the right here, you can use specific animation and select the animation you want so that you see what it actually looks like in your specific animation. All right, so let's move it a bit here, a bit over here. Yeah, I think that's good for now. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and I'm going to right click and remove attached assets. Uh, again, this is just a preview. It doesn't really matter. Um, so back here in our enemy, we actually want to wield this sword. So let's create a new custom event and call it wield sword. I think that's how you spell wield. Now we want to spawn an actor or a sword actor and attach it to our mesh, but we don't have that sword actor yet. So let's create it. In our contents folder, I'm gonna right click and create a new folder called weapons. And inside weapons, I'm gonna create a, bloop, a blueprint of type actor and call this BP sword. That's gonna be a very simple weapon, it just has a static mesh component. Let's call this our sword mesh. And on the right here, just select your sword mesh asset. Uh, and if you do have collision on your weapon, make sure to set it to no collision, otherwise, your um, enemy will collide with it and maybe just fly off the screen. Um, all right, now that we have this sword, let's uh, go back to our base enemy and say spawn actor from class, select our sword actor. And um, the spawn transform, you can just set anything for now. I'm just gonna say get actor transform doesn't really matter because we're going to change the transform by attaching it to our mesh. So pull off of here and say attach actor to component. And we're attaching this actor to our mesh component. And the socket name is the socket we just created, created which is hand underscore r underscore sword underscore socket. Now very important here for the location, rotation and scale rules to be snap to target so that they take the rota uh, location, rotation, and scale from the socket instead of where they actually spawned. That's why this doesn't matter, but we have to add something because it's a required input field. All right, now we can just call wield sword here in our begin play, and you'll see that the enemy is carrying a sword, but let's actually call it in a smart way and make it a behavior tree task. Um, So now I'm gonna go over here back to our behavior tree, create a new task and put it in our tasks folder and call it BTT underscore wield weapon or wield sword. That's what we call this, right? Yeah. Um, now this again, event receive execute AI and finish execute. Off of the pawn, we're gonna cast to our enemy base and call our wield sword. Now there's something really important I wanna show you here. Um, if I call this task from our behavior tree, um, let's say in the beginning of the sequence here, we say wield sword. This is going to be called multiple times. Every time the sequence runs, it's going to call wield sword. Um, now we only want it to wield sword if it's not already wielding the sword. To do that, we will add a decorator and decorators are sort of like if conditions. Um, and it will tell this wield sword to only run if the enemy is not currently wielding the sword. So let's uh, go ahead and create that decorator. So up here uh, on the top, go to new decorator and select the uh, blueprint base decorator. Uh, we're gonna create a new folder here and call this one decorators. And we're gonna name this decorator BTD, which is behavior tree decorator and call it 
um, is wielding weapon. So it's going to be true if they're wielding any weapon. Oh, let's just make a sword right now because that's we only have a sword. <clears throat> All right. So um, unlike the uh, task where we uh, add an event uh, receive AI execution, we're going to go over here on our functions and under override, we're going to find a function called perform conditional check AI. And we're going to override this function. Now, whatever we return here is what this decorator will be returning. So we want it to return true if the enemy is uh, uh, wielding a weapon and false otherwise. So let's actually go back to our uh, base enemy class and add this uh, variable. So I'm going to add a variable here and call it is wielding sword. Um, and this variable will be true. We'll set it to true here after we call our wield sword function. Um, all right. So now back in our decorator here, off of controlled pawn, we can cast to our base enemy and check if is wielding sword and set this as our return value. Great, and that's basically our decorator. So how do we use decorators? Back here in our behavior tree, uh, on this wield sword task, I can right click and say add decorator and select our is wielding sword. So only if the decorator passes will this succeed. So if is wielding sword is true, we want to wield sword. But that's not right. We want if wielding sword is false. So we want to inverse this decorator. And over here we have an inverse condition. And you'll see that between brackets here it says inversed. So that means that if wielding sword is false, then make this node succeed. But what if it fails? If you recall, we said a sequence, if one node fails, then it doesn't continue to do all the other. We actually wanted to check if is wielding sword is not true, then wield sword. Otherwise, do everything else. We don't want to just ignore all of this. So then we have to actually then start using um, a, uh, a selector now instead of a sequence. So this will still be our chase sequence, but off of root, let's get a selector. And in our first part of the selector, we're going to pop in our is wielding sword or our wield sword task. And on the right side of the selector, we're going to pop in our chase player sequence. What this means is that if is wielding sword succeeds, uh, then uh, sorry, if this decorator is uh, succeeds, then do is wielding sword. If it fails, move on to the next part of the sequence. Uh, so it's either going to do this or that per execution. Of course, once this finishes and is wielding sword becomes false again, then it will always go to chase player. So this will then only be called once. Um, all right, so let's see what this looks like. Back in our base enemy, yeah, let's make sure we're not calling anything on begin play here. And we should expect uh, this behavior tree task to only call wield sword once and never call it again. All right. Yeah, now let's see. All right, wield sword might have been too fast, but it was called once and now it's only staying within this sequence. So you see here it's only staying within the sequence and never going back to wield sword. Now I'm going to show you again because it happened really fast and ready. Yeah, so it was called very quickly and then does it call uh, never called again. So that means that we only spawn the sword once, which is what we want. Perfect. And that's how you use selectors together with uh, sequences. And you can also name the selector so we can call it um, uh, wield weapon or attack or, or chase. So it's a selector and selects between wield weapon or chase. 
Um, we can actually also call this combat state, uh, which is good because then we'll, in the next tutorial, we're going to be adding uh, patrolling states, idle states, stunned states, and so on. And we only want to make sure that this is done in the combat state. Excellent. So then, as I mentioned, we're going to be covering perception states and so on in the next tutorial. So I'll see you there.